that's good. I like it there like that. You look like Christmas vomited on oh, you. Perfect, that's what I want. <laughs> we should keep you around. I like oh. this. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we're all right. Okay, um, hello and welcome to In The Loop Wollongong. I'm Nathan. Hi, I'm Natasha. And we have a very festive show for you this month. So festive. So festive. I'm so excited about Christmas. Are you excited? I always love Christmas. What are you going to get up to? like all year round. Ah, oh, that would be perfect. Oh, love it. I'd be broke and fat. <laughs> Oh, well. Talking about fat, I've been stretching my tummy for months. <laughs> Got to. You have to. <laughs> well, coming up later on the show, the Illawarra Mercury's Greg Ellis sat down with climate girl Paris Rains. And Hannah is in the kitchen making some scrummy stuffed capsicums with Vanessa for Paprika. I'll get that out. Paprika. <laughs> paprika. We learned all about the amazing discovery of the Hobbit human from Professor Bert mm, Roberts. That should be interesting. And Crammy and the team from I-98 FM are very lucky they head to Coolangatta. They're doing Segway games. Who knew? <laughs> and we chatted with Michael McKeo from Innovative Business, Fiber Optic Design and Construct. And of course, we get into the Christmas spirit. Music. Christmas, we wish you a Merry Christmas. That was perfect. Oh no, nice. yeah. we're practicing with carols on the ground. <laughs> and later we'll be announcing the winners from last month's competitions. And now let's take a quick look at some of the events that came to Wollongong since our last episode. MTV Beats and Eats Festival rolled into Stuart Park on the 26th of November. 7,000 people enjoyed the food, rides, drinks and amazing acts on the day, with some daredevil attendees even skydiving to the front gates. International superstar Steve Aoki headlined the festival with an epic set supported by Tiger Lily, Savage and Marla, who got the crowd into the right mood throughout the day. If you want to relive the festival, check out the show notes for some handy links. November also saw Wollongong embrace its inner Melbourne as the Wonderwalls Festival returned to add a spray of colour to the city. The three-day festival saw local, national and international street artists gather to apply their unique styles to the city's empty walls. If you want to discover some of the city's newest street art, you can check out the Wonderwalls hashtag on Instagram or go to thewonderwallsfestival.com.au to find a handy downloadable map. Christmas cheer took over Wollongong on December 10th for the 23rd annual Santa Claus Pub Crawl for Charity. Over 10,000 people attended this event this year, raising over $100,000 for the charity. We caught up with Santa Claus himself, Neil Webster, to chat about how the crawl has grown into one of the biggest in the world. It started out 23 years ago with my, myself and a few mates in Santa suits. When we realised it was actually going to grow and we started to hit four or 500 people, we originally used to collect kids' toys, which we'd donate to the South Australian Army for Christmas time. By about the 10th year, we were giving them too many kids' toys, so we switched over to creating a cash-based donation, which is through the sale of wristbands on our website. We're aiming for $120,000 this year. That money goes back into the Salvation Army, Army's programs based here in the Illawarra. Specifically, it goes into kids-based programs to help kids from uh, lower socioeconomic backgrounds. So it's about Santa giving back to the kids in the local area, which is brilliant at Christmas time. As always, Wollongong stepped up in the costume department with a cornucopia of elves, angels, reindeer, and of course, Santas enjoying the night starting at North Gong Hotel before venturing out to other venues throughout the city. If you want to check out all the photos from the crawl, head to the Santa Claus Pub Crawl Facebook page. And now the Illawarra Mercury's Greg Ellis sat down with Wollongong's very own climate girl, Paris Rains, to talk, of course, about all things climate and being invited to speak at the UN Global Compact Leader Summit in New York. This segment is brought to you by Access Law Group and the Illawarra Mercury. Hi, Greg Ellis from the Illawarra Mercury here for In The Loop and I'm here with the climate girl today, Paris Rains. So where does the story all begin for Paris Rains? Yeah, so I grew up here uh, in Wollongong. Uh, I've lived here all of my life and I attribute a lot of my commitment to the environment uh, from being active in the outdoors, living in the Illawarra, being sandwiched between the ocean and the mountain and being able to go surfing in the morning and then up mountain biking in the afternoon and just being out active in nature and out in the environment. So I've been really lucky to live here in Wollongong all of my life. Now, you've been involved with the UN and global summits and all yeah. sorts of things. Did that happen before Climate Girl started? Yeah, so my first UN conference that I spoke at was when I was 13 in Norway. Um, and since that first one, I've been to, to three more since then. Climate Girl itself, did that start after the second time you went to the UN? Uh, after the first time. The so first I was 14 time. when I launched Climate Girl. I really started it because I found that when I was learning about the environment, a lot of information was very scientific and hard to understand and not really targeted at a young audience. And if you think about it, climate change is such a huge issue. It's, it's uh, an issue that affects 
the oceans, it's a pollution issue, it's a health issue, it's an ecosystem issue, it's an education issue and it's a social justice issue. So it's such a huge issue as you can see but it's about how do you break down this issue into smaller pieces. So because once people start to understand an issue they'll start to care and once they start to care they'll start to take action. So that whole circle is about education. That's something that I'm so passionate about. Now, I've seen photos of you in places like Antarctica and things yeah. like that. Can you tell me about some of those trips, what they were and how they came about? Yeah, so last year was probably, it was a huge travel year for me and I firstly went to Antarctica, which was something that was on my bucket list um, as an environmentalist, firstly, to go and learn about such a pristine and vulnerable ecosystem. Um, but also I went there with The Unstoppable, so a group of 100 of Australia's leading entrepreneurs and business people um, went down to Antarctica for a think tank around social, economic and environmental issues facing Australia and the world. And so I went there to learn from all these business leaders about how I can take climate goals to the next level, but also I was there as an influencer to influence some of Australia's leading business owners um, as to how they can be more sustainable in their businesses and thinking about moving towards the sustainable and innovative economy and transitioning to that low carbon economy. Like everyone I've interviewed on In The Loop, we could talk all day, but the <laughs> last question is what next for Paris Reigns? I want to be building Climate Goal into a world class uh, online community um, and I've got some more exciting things that I will share uh, in the future that I've been building and planning in relation to Climate Girl and continuing to speak internationally at conferences and events and meeting so many like-minded, amazing people from all around the world. I'm going to wrap it up here yep. and thank you very much for coming in and talking to us on me. In The Loop it's today. And uh, in a world with a um, sustainable environment makes us all happy. So, exactly. Yes, so <laughs> that's good. Paris Reigns, thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's Hannah from In The Loop here, in the kitchen with Vanessa from Paprika. What are we cooking today, Vanessa? Hi, Hannah. Uh, today we're cooking stuffed capsicum, which is a very, very traditional and very popular dish throughout the Balkans, as well as in Macedonia. So we're going to start off with browning the onions. Do you want to try stirring Can a I? little bit? <laughs> Please, be my guest. So I'm loving learning about traditional Macedonian food. Tell me, how long have you been cooking? I've had this restaurant for just over a year now. Before that, I had a little cafe, but mostly my cooking comes from young age because I come from a family of restaurateurs. My grandfather used to have a restaurant back home. And I grew up there and that's how the love for food developed and my cooking skills, I should say, too. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. So, so Paprika's been open for about a year now. Yes, Yeah. And where can we find now. Paprika? Paprika is located on Coromel Street, uh, 121 Coromel Street. That's just right opposite Half Hotel. Oh, great, yeah. okay. Once the onion becomes translucent, that's when we add up the meat. Okay. And break that up. Please do. What we're trying to achieve here to caramelise the beef, that will go, will intensify the flavour of uh, the meat and the dish itself and also it'll speed up the cooking process a little bit. So what we would like to do now is to add this paprika. Okay. Um, paprika powder is used throughout uh, Macedonian cooking and throughout the Balkan in pff, nearly every dish. Okay. <laughs> There's even a saying that says, well translated in English, word for word means like like paprika in stew. When somebody's a sticky bit, wants yeah. to know everything, you see them everywhere, you find them everywhere. It's like paprika. That's what, you're like paprika in stew, like you're everywhere. <laughs> I like that one. Okay, at this stage now, what I like to do is to put the rice in. One, two, three, four. Just add this tomato paste and fry it off a little bit. Like spread it out? Yes, yes, please do. At this point, I think we have achieved enough caramelization and also the rice has been coated in all these juices that the meat releases and has absorbed all the juices. And all the flavors. Um, yes, and all okay. the flavors. At this stage, you can use chicken stock, you can use beef stock or just simply water. Water, okay. Yeah. So okay, in the meantime, while that is 
cooking away, yep. we're gonna prepare one of the capsicums. All right, so how do we do that? So what we're gonna do, just, do you wanna cut through here? Yeah, yeah. I'll give that a go. Up to there, so you're gonna keep the lid. So like there? Just press, yeah. It's a very good knife, it's a sharp knife, so you won't have trouble. Yeah, that's okay. it. Now we're gonna remove the seeds. All right, and then like this? Yep. That's it. Is that alright? Yeah, of course. <laughs> this is the stage where I would say it's done. Alright, Hannah, how about you have a go? Yeah. Alright, let's give this a go. Yeah, like we said, just go, don't be scared, don't be shy. <laughs> just don't overfill it. Leave some room for the... Um, How's that? A, bit a more? little bit more, maybe just okay. a tiny bit more. One more. One more? All right. Since you, you're a bit shy. Yeah, that's it. Done. Good. Tailed it. Yep. <laughs> so now, we're going to put just a little bit of water in there. And this is in. to help the rice cook. Yeah. Okay. So now, the leads go on. Just grab some of these juices. Here. And does that help with the flavour? Yes. It'll help the flavour and they will get some steam from this water that we're putting in and that will help the cooking process so the capsicums soften up a little bit more. So this will go now in a preheated oven 200 degrees for maybe half an hour. That looks great. There we are. Pick what it looks Yum. like inside. That looks <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Alright, let's give it a go. Yeah. Grab some of this. <laughs> oh my god, that's so nice. <laughs> thank you. No. I'm glad you like it. Yum, thank you. This is absolutely delicious. Thank you so much for coming in today, Vanessa. Thank and you for having me. For teaching me Thanks how to make these. Yum. I'll definitely be coming down to get one. <laughs> most welcome. Thank so this you. is Paprika, the restaurant on Carmel Street across from the Harp. It's definitely worth checking out. Trust me, these are amazing. Paprika is giving away a $100 voucher and to win all you have to do is share the episode or segment on your social media and let us know down in the comments below who you'll be treating to dinner at Paprika. Delish. Delish. <laughs> Next up we caught up with Professor Bert Roberts to learn about his discovery of the Hobbit human and how the distant past can still have an amazing impact on figuring out where humanity is headed next. Bum, bum, bum. I'm Bert Roberts, I'm Professor of Archaeological Science in the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Wollongong. So myself and Mike Morwood, uh, who is another archaeologist, we started off a project looking in Indonesia for really early sites occupied by our ancestors, ancestors of Homo sapiens, our species. Uh, and we started off at a site that we thought this is going to be a kind of good prospective site. It had already been looked at by a, a Dutch priest actually who'd been wandering around this island called Flores in Indonesia. Uh, and he'd seen some stone tools on the surface and he'd do, done a little bit of digging and found some skeletons fairly shallow in the ground. Uh, we wanted to go back there and dig deeper to get to the really early stuff because the earlier stuff is deeper down in the ground. Um, and then we got completely lucky by finding a brand new human species. Um, we weren't looking for a new human species, we were looking for early versions of us. Uh, we still haven't found any early versions of us, but we did find this other human species that was about, you know, we thought then 20,000 years old, but we've recently predated it, it's about 50,000 years old, about the same time, in fact, that people were coming to Australia. There are a lot of interesting features of it, one of which was, of course, is very small human, so about half our height, and a very, you know, maybe only 30 odd, 35 kilos in weight, so that was a fully grown adult of this particular species, Homo floresiensis. Uh, so really unusual. Lord of the Rings was doing the rounds in the movie time. You know, everyone thought this was great to find a small person living in a cave, in a hole in the ground. You know, this was really Hobbit country. Um, but that, from a scientific point of view, apart from being a very small size, the interesting point was we have this very archaic, primitive human living at the same time as we were living in the same region. No one else was supposed to be down in this neck of the woods apart from us and another much earlier human species that had gone out a long time previously called Homo erectus. Neanderthals were still hanging around in Europe, 
but down this end of the woods it was just supposed to be modern humans and suddenly bang we got this brand new human species half our size living until very very recently geologically speaking but it's led on to a number of things other projects throughout Indonesia uh, and one of the things we're now doing is developing a whole new what they call the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence looking at the history of that part of Indonesia Papua New Guinea and Australia trying to tease out what's been happening to our species and other species in the area over the last 130,000 years. We're really trying to work out what's been the environmental history of the entire region. When did people come into different parts of it and what did they do when they got here? How's that changed the vegetation structure of the different places? What's happened to the animals that were here before people first got here? We used to have megafauna in Australia, these giant animals, marsupials, reptiles, birds. They're all gone. Why? We still don't know exactly, but people probably had something to do with it. So we're really using the past as a, as a, as a launching pad to say, well, what might be happening in the future? By looking at some of those key past events and the legacies of those even now that are still trickling through and into the future. So what we see now in the past is something that's relevant to our future. It's not just something that's interesting for its own sake, which it is as well, but it actually does have future ramifications too for managing and conserving our biodiversity and heritage into the future. A lot of what we're going to be doing, it will be in schools and general outreach, including in this region, because we want to get school kids interested in doing STEM and other activities like that in a kind of unusual setting. So it's really kind of STEM by stealth. You know, how can you get people interested in doing STEM? Well, if they don't realise it is STEM, so they're not put off by the idea of trying to do STEM because there's somebody think, well, that's interesting. I'd like to know how we evolved as a species. Well, come and do what we do. It's actually STEM wrapped up in a different guise. So we want to sell this into schools in interesting and innovative ways to get people into doing what we're doing and to, and to help the country in a sense develop more STEM skills and more broadly and, and interfacing with the social sciences and the humanities which is just as important because we've got to get out of speaking just as scientists and talk in other languages that other people can understand as well and so we'll be involved in the science centre as much as we can locally we'll be dealing with schools locally as much as we can and of course we want to be recruiting more and more undergraduates and turning them into researchers if they want to be researchers and if they don't want to be researchers that's fine but as long as they're appreciative of what Australia is at the end of it all, we'll have, we'll have done our job in a sense. Now we segue out of science and see how the I-98 team went playing Segway games with the guys from Segway Tours South Coast. Very funny. Uh, I mean, funny. Uh, we'll show ourselves out. This segment is brought to you by Destination Wollongong and Internetrix. Hey, it's Crammy from I-98. Now today I've brought some of our Street Fleet guys and girls down to the beautiful Coolangatta Estate. And we're gonna have some fun with some segways with Segway Tours South Coast. Now, if you're looking to have a bet, bet on my team, because just quietly, I'm going to win. I'm not gonna let myself lose, so let's do it. Practice is done, we're all very confident now, time to get down to business. The first race is the Rubber Chicken Slalom Relay, Team Blue for the win. <laughs> yes! Go Charlie, go! <laughs> <laughs> First win to the blue team, go blue. Second activity today is the Segway Polo Race. Game on. We're losing. Red team, we might actually have a chance this time. <laughs> oh, I got a new technique. <laughs> Man, I must have been slow. Unfortunately, the red team beat us in that last activity, which was Segway Polo. On to the next activity, which is Segway Soccer. Come on, blue team. Woo, let's go red. Oh, that's the way to do it. Go, Emily. Having an awesome time, but blue team again lost the last game. That means it comes down to the final game, Segway Tag. Come on, blue team. We're back. 
Oh, I love it. Tight circle. Tight circle. Oh, yeah. Oh. All right, as you can probably tell from the huge smile on my face, the blue team was eventually victorious. Check out the grumpy looks on the red team's face. But we've still had an amazing day. Check out the guys, segwaytourssouthcoast.com.au. It's so much fun. Have you ever been on a Segway? I actually have. They're really, really cool. So you jump on, and they're actually really quiet. So you've got to make a noise. So you go, nah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. And if you want to go on a Segway tour, you can. Segway Tours South Coast are giving away a cool and gather vineyard Segway tour. You can sit on some wine, go around with two... <laughs> Not at the same time. <laughs> Not at the same time. No, no, no. And it's for two guests, valued at $200. And if you want to win it, all you have to do is share the episode or segment on your social media and let us know in the comments below who you'll be taking with you. For Innovative Business this month, we sat down with Michael from Fibre Optic Design and Construct to find out how they are helping make Australia's networks as fast as the speed of light. This segment is made possible by Advantage Wollongong, Lancaster Law and Mediation and Kazen Business and Financial. My name is Michael McKeo and I'm the owner of a company Fibre Optics Design and Construct. Fibre Optics Design and Construct primarily focuses on fibre optic networks. So the places fibre optic networks will be found, most people will know about the NBN. So we have done some of the NBN work. We're also looking after the fibre optics on modes, pretty well all of the motorways in Sydney. So your M5, your Lane Cove tunnels, your M7s, the Harbour Bridge, all of those motorways have got a huge amount of fibre optics in them that connect all of the closed circuit TV cameras, the speed signs, the variable message boards that come up, and all sorts of communications equipment that's built into roads that most people won't know about and it's all connected to a fibre optic backbone. And then we also get involved in uh, fibre optics in mines, so whether it be coal mines, gold mines, all sorts of places like that. Only where distance is an issue, uh, running copper cables for those long distance communications is a problem. So the fibre optics take away those problems and we can run it. 10, 20, 30 kilometres without any, any repeaters or extra equipment. The business started with just me. Um, I had a, a part-time person helping me to run the office. I worked stupid numbers of hours to get the business up and running for those first couple of years. So about five and a half years ago, I started employing people. And when the NBN was really cranking up, we got as big as uh, 20 people in the organisation. Um, and when you're only focusing on fibre optics, that is a very large organisation for, the, for Australia. Uh, we were probably the biggest fibre optics company at the time. Being based here, well, Wollongong's God's country. It's the best part of the world to live in. <laughs> We've got uh, the beaches and the mountains moments away. Uh, my sport is paddling ocean skis out on the ocean, so I love being on the water. So being able to live near the water uh, and commute to work uh, is not a problem. So the business, the office is based here in the Illawarra, so I get to spend some time in the office. I do spend most of my time up in Sydney. So at the moment we're working in the Kingsgrove area or, or quite often up in the mascot type part of the world. It takes us roughly an hour to get there from the Illawarra. But the people that are coming from Western Sydney or Northern suburbs of Sydney, on a good day it might take them an hour to get to work. But on a bad afternoon or a, a morning where there's accidents, it could take them two, three hours to get to or from work. Where for us, even if there are bad road conditions, sometimes it might take an hour and a quarter. But generally speaking, it's an hour either way, uh, no matter what happens traveling from the Illawarra. So I don't see the distance as being a, a problem for us. We've put ourselves in a great position over the last 11 years. Uh, we've shown ourselves as experts in the industry so with a lot of new infrastructure projects going on in Sydney at the moment, we're being asked to do a lot of the work. So with West Connex, which is the, the largest road infrastructure project to ever happen in Australia, uh, we've been asked to help out on that project. Uh, even on the design side of it, we've been asked to help out with the design. We're in a great position to take on a lot of that work. So we're expecting to grow over the next few years while we take on a lot of those bigger infrastructure projects. This month, the innovative business, we're giving away not one, 
the two copies of the headline Edge, how you can get famous in the media through free PR by Neryl East. To win, all you have to do is share the episode or segment on your social media and let us know in the comments what your tip for small business is. Hmm. 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 Well, finally this month, we head into the city to check out all of the fun from the first ever Carols on Crown. My favourite. This segment is made possible by Wollongong Central. Discover the city. Hey, it's Crammy. We are here in the mall for the very first Carols on Crown. It's going to be amazing. We've got some great local talent to perform. Plus, Christine Arnu is going to be live on this stage performing. And the fireworks are going to be spectacular at 9 o'clock. Everyone is here pumped up and excited to sing some Christmas carols. Aren't you guys? <laughs> it's the very first Carols on Crown. It's going to be amazing. Merry Christmas. I think it's a sick opportunity for the city to have carols right here. Having live music and kind of like an outreach event to the whole community is really cool as well. And tonight I'm playing Hallelujah and Have Yourself a Little Merry Little Christmas. Um, I'm gonna mash them up and make it a bit of like more of like a folky vibe. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. From now on, your troubles will be all so sad. Hey, it's Crammy, and we are backstage at Carol's on Crown, and I'm hanging out with the amazing Christine Arnoux. How are you? Really, really happy, excited. This is summer Christmas in Australia. How good is it? It's awesome. I mean, this is this is the only Christmas um, I know, and you, and all of us. And, you know, Christmas is about the sun, the sea, the surf, regular swims in the ocean. Uh -huh. uh, and if you can't do that, then you blow up swimming pool in the backyard and the hose going. Now you're here to perform. What's your favourite Christmas carol? You know, it's it's one that I struggle with all the time, every single year, because you only give it, ever get to sing them one. I've written a Christmas song. You have too, actually, yeah. I'll be singing that tonight, and it is about the Australian Christmas in our sunburnt country. And um, and that, you know, it's it's dream time in the land, you know, it's Christmas in the land of the dream time, and that's, that's what Christmas is to me. Nathan? Yes? Get your tinsel out. Oh, alright. We're going to do the tinsel swing because it's time to give out last month's surprises. Ooh, alrighty. Ooh. Well, Warren Goodall thinks Jade should have a go at canyoning at Macquarie Ooh. Pass and has won the $220 voucher from Sydney Microlight Centre in Albion Ooh, Park. I hope she's brave. And Louise Bradford, who's a favourite local artist, is Dee Kramer's great work he's done has won a signed frame limited edition print of Donald Key's The Bridge of Reflection. Beautiful. Mm. Well, that's our show for this Alrighty. month. Thanks to everyone who made it possible. <laughs> if you enjoyed it, let us know by hitting the thumbs up button. And if you want to know more about any of this month's stories, you can find the links in the show notes below. And make sure you stay in the loop by liking us on Facebook and subscribing on YouTube. That's right. Yep. In the Loop Wollongong exists because of the support of our awesome partners. So please show some love to our media partner, i98FM. <laughs> They've got some good songs on that radio station. Uh, made possible by partners, Wollongong Central Discover the City, where I like to shop till you drop. <laughs> Relativity, not just taken, created. They make you look good. <laughs> the University of Wollongong, where I spent all my money on coffee. <laughs> and hex. <laughs> uh, Advantage Wollongong. Great place. It is. <laughs> Destination Wollongong. They've got all the hot tips of where to go locally. That's right. Mm -hmm. Illawarra Mercury. Read it every day. Keeping us informed. That's right. All the hard-hitting stuff. <laughs> Internetrix. I love the internet. Love the internet. <laughs> Let's so get cool. online. I love That's memes. where we are now, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Lancaster Law and Mediation. Well, they'll have you back. K's in Business and Financial. Hi, Dad. <laughs> Our promotional partners, who you can see here. 
and our super cool kitchen partners keeping us hungry. <laughs> well fed. <laughs> well fed. We hope everyone has a Merry Christmas. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in 2017 Great. on In The Loop Wollongong. Have a Merry Christmas. Bye. Like that. Yeah, pretty much. Did you see Yowies are coming back? Oh my god. <laughs> With the yes. toys and everything? Apparently they were a hit in America or something. That was funny. Good, okay. good scripting, guys. Good work, Kira. I don't want a love for Christmas. There is just one thing Oh, that's going on the blooper reel, right? I love that song. <laughs>